Are you a fan of the Highlands? Are you a fan of Speyside or the Lowlands? Perhaps a fan of Isla or Campbelltown? Regardless, Happy New Year. Hello, whiskey folk. Happy New Year, everybody, and welcome to the first V Pub of two, uh, 2020, 2020. Is it the start of a decade? I know that that's controversial. For me, it's the start of a decade, even although there are pedants out there that'll tell me otherwise. If I talk about the start of the 20s, because this is the 20s now, the 1920s was last century, I'll be talking about this year. For me, it's the start of a decade for let's say language sake. But it's nice to welcome you all here. Well over a hundred of you waiting. Um, I was worried that January you'd all be a wee bit whiskeyed out and a bit fed up, but of course you're um, still enjoying your whiskey and uh, small amounts. My printer seems to want to print something just as I go live. Somebody in the house is printing something. <laughs> I apologize for the noise in the background. Um, but yes, I'm very glad that you are still enjoying your whiskey and that you're not whiskeyed out. And I'm very glad that you're here for tonight's VPUB. Wonderful to see you all at the start of the show. I'll, I've, I do get reminded to do this from time to time. People often say at the start of the show, Roy, you should always talk about what the VPUB actually is. Um, lots of people click on thinking that it's a pre-recorded video. Uh, they don't realise that it's a kind of long uh, live event thing. And lots of people do pick up in the replay. It's wonderful that so many of you do. That's when all the comments come in and I get the feedback and things. It's fantastic. But it's very much designed to be here now, to be a live event for people um, to come along and participate and chat to each other, pull up a chair in what we call the lounge, the live chat here. If you're wondering what the live chat is, look, at the, look for the wee button underneath the video window right about here, I think. Um, and it says live chat, and you'll see that there are people in there talking to each other. These people are here live participating, and some of them like to refer to each other as uh, affectionately as fellow barflies. That's what the VPUB is about. I try and keep a loose theme so that, you know, there is some value in watching it after the event, and there perhaps could be some enjoyable information shared, um, some enlightenment passed around. Not so much from me, but by the folk in the chat. So welcome, everybody. I've been really looking forward to getting things started this year. And although it wasn't that long ago that I did the, the end of year live stream on Sunday the 29th with Scott, Sevy and all the fantastic guests I had, what a great day that was. Um, it's been too long because I was very much enjoying the weekly live streams that we did in December. Anyway, before I uh, give you an overview of this evening and uh, talk about uh, and welcome everybody in the chat, I'll let you know that uh, the glass I'm going to raise tonight is a sample. I think these samples, I was trying to work it out, um, and if I get this wrong, it's not only my fault, it's someone else's fault. Whoever sent me this sample, a cardinal sin is to not put your name on it. I think this is from Cresimere, but I'm not 100% sure. It's the Spaniard, the Compass Box uh, Core range. It's the first time I um, am aware of trying this. I'm sure maybe I've tried it in the past, but it's the first time I've actually sat down and sipped it. And I have to say it's perfect for the first dram of the night. 43%, not so expensive for compass box, and I'm enjoying it. So Cresimere, if it's you, thank you very much. If it's not, I apologise. Please tell me who sent this. And I'll raise a glass and say slancha. Welcome everyone. The theme for tonight is to talk about regionality and regions in Scotch whisky. Now you'll see in the title and the thumbnail, I've also used the word terrar in there as well. Um, and that's very much to talk about that. I Because it, it's open to interpretation, certainly, but I'd like to give you how I interpret it now. I reserve the, the right to change my mind tomorrow, of course, but how I differentiate regions and regionality in Scotch maybe touch upon things like provenance, um, but also talk about terrar and how I feel that is different from regionality. 
Um, it's something that's very much part of the Scotch whisky landscape. It's becoming uh, more of a, a, an easy way to describe global whisky, honestly, not just by country, um, but by regions within a country sometimes. Um, but tonight's subject matter is going to revolve around regionality in Scotch whisky and perhaps even touch a wee bit on the sensitive subject of terrar in Scotch whisky. But let's jump into the chat and uh, welcome some of you fantastic barflies. Of course, I'll be looking for the orange flashes. So if you're highlighting anything for my attention, make sure you write at Aquavite or Aquavite and hopefully I'll catch it. Let's see how many of you I can catch tonight. My friend over in Germany, Whiskey Jason, you started saying Happy New Year. Right back at you, Jason. Thanks so much for all your support last year. I look forward to hanging out with you in these live streams a bit further in 2020, my friend. Mark Slinger is here. Good to see you, Mark, as well as Daniel Vermas from Hungary. You star, Daniel. Good to see you. The Whiskey Influencer is in. I think... I want to guess that you're in New York, my friend. I'm not sure if I've remembered that correctly. Marcus Kreitner, I know I've got him wrong in the past, but he's certainly in Austria, and he's hopefully sitting next to Christina. Happy New Year to you both, my friend. I've got a sample of yours sitting here. I've got your Octomore Masterclass, and uh, I'll certainly get to it tonight, perhaps during the stream, Marcus, but thank you so much for your generosity. Uh, Radek is in as well. He's saying, here, I happy New Year. Happy New Year, Radek, to you as well, my friend. Graham Murphy is here. He's saying, Barfly in this corner, a great topic to come back to the VPUB after a long time away. Happy New Year. Graham, happy New Year to you too as well. And a long time away, I'm assuming you're talking about you rather than me, because it feels like a wee while to me, but it's only been a few days. <laughs> December was great. Tell me what you thought about the December streams, the weekly streams in December. It was easy for me to do because I had a good plan of what I wanted to do in December. Um, you know, I'm going to talk about it a wee bit in a second because I've got thanks and things to talk about and the streams in December that were cool, that I enjoyed very much. I hope you did too. The Whiskey Bowman, Chris is here. Good to see you, my friend. He's saying, hey, Roy, happy new year indeed. And to you, Chris, as well. Local boy, Chris. In fact, uh, the Whiskey Bowman and I went to the same school together in the same year. P Head is here as well. Good to see you, my friend. Good to welcome you in again, as well as Andy down south. Our baggy, good to have you. Uh, David Evans is here. Good to see you, David. Whiskey Novice, that's Jim Whiskey Novice. He's got a YouTube channel. He's over in Northern Ireland. Uh, just invested in some new tech. He's doing some green screening for his background now. Very impressed I was too, Jim. Good for you. The Whiskey Friend Alan is in, also another YouTuber, a fellow peer uh, creator on YouTube. Um, and he's saying Happy New Year as well. Good to have you in, Alan. I'll raise a glass for you in a wee while. Uh, John Paul Vanderhoven saying hi, Roy Rico is saying hi. Good evening, everyone. Scotty is in. Good to have you, Scotty. Alexandru is here again. Good to have you, Alexandru. Uh, uh, whiskey Influencer is saying he's never whiskeyed out. Good for you. Lee Hosey over in Haddington is here. Good to have you. Um, and your buddy, Matt Bishop. Uh, I'll point out to Matt that I'm not talking about terriers tonight. I'm talking about terrar. I think he made a pun earlier based on uh, terrar and how one might perhaps pronounce it. I hope I'm pronouncing terrar correctly. It's definitely not a terrier. Alistair Gray is here. Good to have you, Alistair. And Menno's multi-mission is here as well. Good to have you. Always Menno. Arnie Tiger is in. Good to have you, Arnie. Welsh Toro is here. Good to have you, Welsh. Always good to have you in, buddy. Cressimir is here. He's saying hi there. Cressimir, I'm not sure if you picked up. I was asking you if this Spaniard was indeed a sample from you. If it's not a hope, I pick up who it was actually from. Bart is here. Malt Chronicles is in saying, Happy New Year, Roy. Let's hope these 20s are better than those in the 19th or the 20th century. Um, ah, did I say 19th century earlier? I meant 1920s. Uh, I notice I'm susceptible to a lot of uh, slips of the tongue recently. I think I always was, but I'm just becoming more sensitive to them, perhaps. Skogsmard is here. Fantastic to see you, my friend. Good to welcome you. And Simon Ray, of course, Simon. Always great to have you, my friend. Tony Evans is saying, Happy New Year. Hope you, hope you get back uh to talk about the dirty dark side later sounds really interesting i think tony's talking about me i'm going to use this platform tonight as a bit of a confessional and talk about how recently i was uh, i want to say seduced but that, that's kind of placing the blame elsewhere and that's not what it's about there was an opportunity for me to buy a bottle that had no other interest for me other than to be able to sell on again uh, hopefully quite quickly, and make some money on. I paused, and I considered, and I thought no, and then immediately thought yes. 
worked out a way to be able to do it, worked out a way to justify it to myself and to anybody that wanted to ask me about it, such as my wife. And I pulled the trigger and I went with it. And I'll tell you how it went later. It, it wasn't good. There's a spoiler. Malt Monk is in. That's Justin. Good to see you. And he's saying Happy New Year to all. Happy New Year to you as well, Justin. Uh, Rolf is here. Ebhead, fantastic. And Happy New Year to you, my friend. Chris, the, the last drop, is also here saying Happy New Year. Uh, Happy New Year to you as well, Chris. And uh, Southern uh, SoCal Dram Tram is in. That's uh, Matt and Caesar over in Southern California uh, recently started their own YouTube channel creating and sharing whiskey through YouTube as well. Uh, Happy New Year, boys. Nice to welcome you in. Uh, and I was right, Cresimir is confirming that indeed the Spaniard is from him. So the last sip, Cresimir, is to say slant you and thank you very much. I'm very quickly going to pour a sample, get a clean glass here, from my friend Rico, Rico Donert, who I've noticed is in tonight. Um, I don't have an uncorking tonight. I think I kicked... Um, a few bottles over, over the course of uh, December, um, on the, the last live stream, the 29th of December, between myself, Scott and Sevy, we uncorked four or five bottles here that night alone. Uh, it was good fun. Uh, believe me, there was nothing too precious, nothing that you guys haven't heard from me before, but it was good fun uh, freeing some of those drams together. Um, this one is from Rico, and it's a Glen Cadam, 17-year-old triple cask portwood finish. Uh, one of, uh, it looks like 1,128 bottles, so quite a decent um, release from Glen Cadam. 46% ABV, and he has not only told me that it's from him, but when he sent it to me. See, Rico knows that I struggle to get to samples sometimes. <laughs> Rico, thank you very much, and I also want to pick up Somebody that's bought me a virtual dram. And it looks like I may have missed it. It is indeed from uh, Cesar and Matt over in the US saying, Aquavite, we loved the weekly live streams during December. Always welcome the great content. And without it, I don't know if I, Matt would have picked up that Kilcarran that I'm now in love with. Good for you. I don't think Kilcarran is always for newbies. But I think if you're a few steps into your whiskey journey, if you're enjoying your whiskey and if you're enjoying characterful whiskies and the 12 year old it can depending on what you sip it with it can sometimes be a wee bit subtle but it's clearly a wonderful whiskey and suddenly everybody's talking about Kilcarran right now and I think that's based on the year that Kilcarran had last year they brought out their single casks um, they reinforced the 12 year old they kept the prices the same as well they brought out the new cast strength fabulous eight-year-old cast strength that they're batch two of the heavily peated just kind of bringing everybody around to to let them see that they're maturing as a distillery they're bringing out fantastic stuff and they're keeping the prices utterly accessible and real so cheers to Kilcarran cheers to you Matt and Caesar over in the states and uh thanks to Rico for the sample oh wow I smell the port on this Oh, wow. Very whiny on the back of that Spaniard. Uh, nice kind of cranberries and jam and things. Very nice. Thank you, Rico. One of the Coquerin releases last year was also Portwood. I didn't get a bottle. Sevy did, and he shared a, a wee sample with me. Let's catch up with the chat. Um, Zach Andrews is here saying, evening Roy, happy new year. Happy new year to you as well, Zach. Fantastic to welcome you in. Alexandra is here saying, I got a 2019 supernova and I feel it will go the same way as yours did. Um, I, in, in terms of, are, are you thinking about uh, reselling it? I mean, the, the latest uh, supernova, so the supernovas of, of the past from our bag have always done very, very well at auction over the years and have held the prices and increased over time. But a lot of that to do was Ardbeg telling us that it was the final release of Supernova. But of course, last year we saw they brought out uh, their most expensive release of Supernova to date. 
Um, so I wonder if that's what you're talking about, Alexandra. Um, I wish you better luck than me, how I got on. David Parts is saying, even Roy, and Happy New Year, Happy New Year to you as well, my friend. Mark Slinger is asking, if I opened the Black Friday 21 behind me, uh, that's this uh, from the Whiskey Exchange. Uh, it was actually Sevy that secured that bottle for me. Um, I believe it to be a Glen Burgie, 21 year old Glen Burgie, and it's still fully sealed. Maybe tonight's the night to open it. Who knows? Glen is quite light. So if I do open it, it should probably be uh, quite early. Although I think the EBV on it is quite decent at 53, excuse me, 53.1%. Blissful Mr. D is in saying I'd go for terroir, 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 terroir. I think, um, Martin, I think you're probably right. And you're uh, an allocation that would know better. So terroir. Let's go for terroir. Greg is here as well. And if anybody knows, it should be Greg, because Greg is in France. And he's saying, I guess I'm the only French person at the moment. I should maybe mention in a video how to spell terroir. No big deal. Do it as you wish. Uh, more interested. I know how to spell it, I believe, um, unless I've spelt it wrong here. Oh, I think I've spelt it correctly. Um, it's more the pronunciation. I always feel a wee bit awkward with French pronunciation, but I think it's just an exposure thing. I used to feel awkward about Spanish pronunciation until I started to enjoy learning Spanish and then I chilled out about it. But I think words like croissant for me are difficult because you need to learn how to pronounce in a way that you're really not used to doing. No nonsense whiskey is in as well, Vin. Good to see you, my friend. Good to see you. And Graham Young has bought me a virtual dram as well, and he's saying, Roy, cheers from the work lounge. Hi, Barflies. Good for you, Graham. Um, stealing a few minutes to say hello to your fellow Barflies. Cheers to you, buddy. Got to meet so many of you last year. So many of you that are in here tonight. Um, it was an absolute pleasure. Sometimes when I go through the comments and things, and I jump back into the videos and I catch the live chat and I look at it and I pick up some of the comments that I've missed while I've been doing this monologue and our distractions. I'm blown away by how many of you contribute valuable, positive comments, say nice things to each other, but also how many of you have made the effort to come over to Scotland and I've been able to meet you, or perhaps I've been able to meet you in your own country, the US, Germany, etc., uh, down south. Um, and it's fantastic. And it's good that that seems to be building and building and building. That's why the Aquavitae Barflies Facebook group was kind of created in order to encourage people to come together and share events, things that they're going to, whether it's just a local whiskey tasting, a whiskey festival, a trip somewhere, whatever it may be, coming into Scotland to visit a distillery, visiting a distillery in Ireland or England, wherever you're going and you want to open yourself up to hooking up with fellow barflies, please share it in that Facebook group because that's what it's for, to make everybody realise that it's nice that we've got this virtual platform, but there's nothing really virtual about it. Just, just the fact that we are using this technology to share whiskey. Uh, Greg's Whiskey Guide is saying, yep, Aquavita, but when you're adding your charming Scottish accent to croissants and anything French, I can resist, of course. I prefer when it is spelled by a Scottish woman. Love Scottish sounds. Again, I don't know what that sounds like to me. I guess I, I never will, unless I become a fluent French speaker. It's unlikely. Seriously, serious is in. Good to see my friend. Um, and Roy remembers your name. That's what pushed me to become an Aquavitae patron. <laughs> right, okay. Uh, seriously, serious. I know your name is Sterling. Um, it's wonderful to welcome you in. I got to meet you. I got to shake your hand. Um, that was fantastic. <laughs> but, but I worry, I panic, because I don't normally have a very good memory. Um, for remembering things like that. So if I remember your name, I, I'm just as impressed with myself as, um, <laughs> as, you, as you might be because um, it's, it's something that takes a lot of effort. And I think most people suffer from that as well. And when I meet people and I see their face, I'm very good at remembering faces, but often it's difficult for me to match the face and the name. And sometimes when I'm shaking your hand, you'll see me 
it'll be in my head, I'll be going, Sterling, 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 <laughs> repeating it in the hope that I can remember it later. And inevitably, especially if there's whiskey involved, there's a good chance uh, that I'll forget and we can all be forgiven for forgetting, I guess. Jimmy Legg is saying, I have tentative plans to come see you in late August or early September this year. Get ready. As long as it is late August, uh, August is a break time for me. Um, but but Jimmy, Blair, that would be amazing if I finally uh, got to shake your hand. It would be fantastic. Mikey Hayes here, and he's just bought me a virtual Grammy saying, here's to fantastic 2020 for Aquavite and all us butterflies. Slant you that Mikey, that's a great sentiment. And uh, let's raise a glass in the hope that you and I can get together again once more in 2020. Slant you, my friend. For somebody that doesn't always enjoy a port finish, honestly, Finding this very tasty tonight. That's a good one. It goes a wee bit tart and tannic on the finish, thins out on the finish. But the flavour is still there. And the Hopper Stewart is saying, Aquavita names to faces. It's the same for us all, and it doesn't get any better with age. Stuart, I absolutely agree. Can I tell you what's worse? In this environment where we've all got kind of pretend names on YouTube, and perhaps on Patreon, as Sterling's mentioned, uh, we've got a different um, name that we use in that environment and a different name on Instagram or Twitter. And then an email comes through and the name is, is different again. Can I tell you how difficult it is to match it up then? And there's no face to match that against. And there's no system that I've come up with of keeping notes that is uh, powerful enough in order for me to make a lot of connections in the chat. So as long as you forgive me and you're patient with me sometimes. The one glass man is here. Hey, Warner, it was a fantastic privilege to meet you last year. And he's saying there's always a plan to fly back to Scotland and meet again Aquavite. Good to hear it, my friend. Mock Chronicles is saying I've got the Ralphie Glenallachie Port 13-year-old. It's the only one I... No, it's not the only one I, did, I didn't buy. I did buy it. In fact, it's up here with the Scotch Test Dummies baseball cap draped over the top of it. I did get that one. But that's fully matured in port. Don't know what to make of it. I haven't even opened mine yet. I have no intention of selling that bottle. It's it's up there with my little kind of... Up here you'll see all the kind of... Uh, you can see the Ralphie jacket, the Scotch Test Dummies hat, uh, the Scotch Test Dummies cowboy hat thing, no nonsense whiskey flask, Crowded Barrel, Whiskey Tribe uh, Barrel, um, Barley and Pete up there from Whiskey Tribe. All of this is my kind of little homage to to my peer creators out there in the whiskey tube world. Um, and up there you'll see Ralphie's Kalila, you'll see his uh, Glenallachie as well, both of those are unopened. I've tried both of those. Um, but his other bottle, the Ben Nevis, that he, um, that he released in, in collaboration with the Good Spirits Company, I've opened that uh, and I've shared that a number of samples. And of course, um, a bottle of that has been given away uh, as a prize um, to John. And uh, John and I are just working out how to get it across to him in the US. He's got a willing mule that's going to take over to him. So that's kind of cool. Uh, finally, Jonathan Flowers is here. Jonathan, fantastic to see you. I got to hang out with you and Zan last year. It was a real privilege. Uh, those guys were over here getting married last year. Fantastic. Uh, did you get to try Deanston's Union release yet? Yes, I have. I've tried it a couple of times. The union release from Deanston, I'm not going to, I'm not going to use now to have a whinge about it because you're just asking me about what I thought about it. I, I've had a whinge directly with them on Twitter. I've had a, a, a perhaps I've shared it with you already. I felt it was too expensive. Um, it's maybe not too expensive for the whiskey, uh, but it's a big, it was a big jump in price for me, £110 for that Deanston release. Um, uh, it, it caused me to pause, it really did. But in the end, um, I listened to what the Eastern had to say. They had, they were very, very confident about it. They said, you need to try it. Uh, but right now, on the neck pour, um, I've had two drums out of it, so I've had a second pour. It's very PX. So if you're somebody that likes to, the tomato PX or a su super heavily uh, sherried style, sweet sherry style, PX sherry style, then you might connect and enjoy that. For me, I'm going to need to sit with it a wee bit more. It's very good whiskey. Honestly, it is very good whiskey, but it is very heavily sherried. For me, that makes it enjoyable, but it makes it one dram. It's not a Moorish thing for me. Once I've finished a dram, I'm ready to switch it up and it's something else a bit more vibrant and challenging. 
I don't often session heavily sherried or very, very sweet whiskies. Uh, no one has whiskies, just bought me a dram. You star Vinny saying, full head of cold today. I was sick this week as well, Van, right up until yesterday morning. I thought that this live stream wasn't going to happen. That's why I didn't advertise it until yesterday because I was sick, but I recovered yesterday morning. Full head of cold today, so time to dose up and get to bed, unfortunately. Happy New Year, Roy and Flies. Listen, Vin, whatever you do, get yourself an early bed and try and recover, my friend. Slanchava. Literally, the translation is good health, buddy, and I mean it. Cheers. Oh. Triketra Stewart is in saying, Agvidi did not go for the Deanston, but the Bunahavan Coterie release and like it. But it was £145. And I think the Coterie, if I'm not mistaken, Was it non-age statement? I feel like it was non-age statement, but that might be my memory failing me. Tim is in. Don't pass whiskey saying, hi, Roy, just unpacked my unopened bottles to lay on their sides to wet the corks for a few hours. Um, If it's new, I, for me, as long as... Uh, I, I guess it could work. If that works for you, Tim. For me, I, I've got this kind of muscle memory thing where I'm opening whiskey. I, I tend to tilt it and get the cork wet. How much of a real difference it actually makes, I'm not so sure. But if it's an old bottling, and it doesn't need to be decades old, if it's just been sitting on a shelf, especially if it's in a dry environment for a little while, be careful of the cork and treat the corks very, very gently. I'm sure we've all succumbed to weak corks in the past. Looks like a new name has just bought me a dram, a uh, Roman Bosu. Bosut, I bet you that's French and I'm ruining it. Roman, I'm so sorry if I'm making a mess of your name. Uh, he's saying Happy New Year to you, buddy. Very much enjoying the channel and streams. Slancha, thank you so much. I hope maybe you can send me a message and phonetically <laughs> spell out uh, your name to help me pronounce it, uh, Roman. But thank you so much for your generous virtual ram. Slancha. I'm glad that you're enjoying it too. Anyway, we should kind of go on with topics, I think. <laughs> but sometimes I just like to hang out with you guys and that's what it's all about, right? So, yes, uh, it's no coincidence that today um, that I scheduled this live stream for today. This has been um, on the, the topic list for a while. You might have heard me mention actually last year when I bumped this topic for another one last year. So I guess some of you knew it was coming, this idea, this concept of regionality in Scotch whisky. But it's no coincidence that I scheduled it for today because earlier today I got to hang out with Mark Rainier. Those of you who don't know who Mark Rainier is, he's um, originally from Murray McDavid, the independent bottler, um, then went on to Brookladdy. Um, to revitalise uh, and reopen Brookladdy. Then he went on to Waterford. And his most recent project is uh, rum, renegade rum out in Granada. So super driven guy, a uh, super passionate guy, uh, very, very focused, very, very um, opinionated, um, very outspoken. Some people uh, refer to him as a bit of a, a maverick and things in the whiskey industry. But I've always been fascinated by him. I've been fascinated by what he's been able to achieve, been fascinated by the drama of his life and what he's achieved. Um, and I got an opportunity to spend a bit of time with him today and I jumped at the chance. Um, and knowing that this topic was in the back burner, I slotted it in for today because I knew that if I was in front of Mark, I'd get a chance to talk to him um, about uh, regionality. I'd get to talk to him about terroir or terroir. Um, and specifically how it relates to Scotch whisky, because he was one of the champions about talking about that concept. Um, and it was, a, it was it was indeed an interesting discussion. Um, but Mark is the type of guy who's so full of things to share, so impassioned that the discussion, I mean, literally, during it was less of a discussion and more me just listening. It really was, and it was fascinating. A fascinating, fascinating way to spend some uh, time listening to Whiskey Chat. But I did ask him outright. I said, uh, specifically with his, his time in Brookladdy, um, about how he tackled the topics of terroir and about trying to raise the 
transparency stakes at Brook Laddie because there's no doubt that would have seen a lot of resistance and it would have been difficult to structure and put into place and manage and and then try and um, educate the the consumer and talk to them about how to access the information, why the information was important and things. Um, and it was nice to kind of have some things confirmed to what I believe. So just at the top, I'm going to spend time talking about regions and Scotch whiskey. I think it's important. Lots of people are saying that they're redundant now and they don't really have a place anymore. And I get it and I understand why they're saying that, but I also want them to understand what Scotch whisky regions meant for me and how they helped me in my whisky journey and how I still think that they have a form of relevance. But more than anything, I want to remove Scotch whisky regions from any talk of terroir because they are not, in my interpretation, they are not the same thing. Terroir to me, the literal translation um, from the Latin Terry, terry is it or um, I'm not sure but it's the same in any Latin language it literally means from the earth so if it's something that's a product of produced by the earth then it's a product of terroir that makes perfect sense so in wine production the vines, the grapes themselves are the product and they are influenced by their terroir. Barley or any grain used in whiskey, the same. However, if the distillery that, the, that produces or, or takes that barley through the process of mashing, fermentation, distillation, um, and then eventually maturation, they at that point, that's not anything to do with terroir. That's to do with place, with process. Yes, that's provenance, and it's a product of that location and that distillery, but terroir's already passed at that point. I just want to shout out to a couple of virtual drams that's just come in quickly from, from Andy Maltbox. A lot of you got to check out Andy. Uh, he joined us. He was my first guest at the end of 2019's uh, show the live stream um, and uh, it, was, it was a privilege to have Andy on and I'm very glad he was able to join us. He said, Happy New Year, mate. Uh, look forward to more drama together. I'm sure you mean drams as the year goes on. Slanche, Andy. Um, congratulations on reaching a thousand subscribers as well. Well deserved. My friend Anthony Dunn from Ireland is saying, Happy New Year, Roy. Looking forward to this topic. Been listening to the Whiskey Cast podcast on this subject and terroir in the States and what the legal status is of terroir and regions there. Well, I'm sure that that would be a much more informed uh, podcast to listen to. Um, I didn't know that that had happened. I've kind of lost touch with that podcast. It's just a time issue. Um, I, I wasn't aware that they had done one. It'd be interesting to see how much overlap. Uh, there is between what we talk about here tonight and what was in there. But my interpretation of terroir is that it's a product. What The reason that this is on my topic to talk about is one of my favourite publications that comes out every year is the Malt Whiskey Yearbook. And one of the editorials that they put together um, for the last, the 2020 edition, which came out, I think, at October time, was Whiskey Regions, uh, are they still relevant? But very, very quickly, they stopped talking about uh, Whiskey Regions. Or it wasn't that... It wasn't that it was quick, it was that they eventually stopped talking about whiskey regions and they talked about the Dave Broom article in his Whiskey Atlas book from 2010. And Dave Broom starts to talk about uh, terroir, but he talks about it being um, much more to do, and in my interpretation of his words anyway, much more to do with process and much more to do with um, how the people are sometimes not talked about when we talk about terroir. And that seemed odd to me. I understand that there is a direct impact on whiskey from human hands, from their methods, from their structure, from their processes, from the daily toil that they put into making whiskey if they are so allowed, if, it's, if there are manual processes in that distillery. I understand all of that and I understand how there are regional cultures that can bleed into that whiskey as well. But that's, to me, that's not terroir. That's not a product of the earth. That's a geographical discussion that if you pushed it maybe, um, but it's much more likely to be about the processes, the culture, 
um, and the way that that dist distillery produces whiskey. So I felt that that was slightly different. But the rest of this article, it's a Charlie McLean, Charlie, it's Charlie McLean article, and the rest of this article is very relevant and very good. And it talks about how we ended up with these uh, regions in the first place. And actually the regions that we know now today, the five regions of Highland, Lowland, Speyside, um, Campbelltown and Isla, is actually a very modern concept. Um, certainly to be defined in that way is very, very recent. Um, but I'm also curious as to how you guys interpret terroir. Have you got have you got an opinion about it? And also, I'm more interested how whiskey regions either help or distract you when it comes to Scotch whiskey, because some people are starting to feel that it's a bit distracting. There's an article in here, um, or there's a quote, there's a quote in here from a. Mark Thompson, who's the Glenfiddich, uh, uh, one of the main uh, Glenfiddich Global Ambassadors, and he talks about how he applauds um, us talking less about whiskies by region and talking, speaking more about whiskies by flavour. And of course, that that's natural. Uh, that makes sense for a, a, an ambassador to speak like that, especially from a producer who's exploring. So we've got Bolveni. He's responsible for Bolveni as an example. They do peat week now, so there you've got Bolveni doing a very heavily peated release. Um, when they're in the heart of Speyside. And it's a little bit like um, a peated region like Isla, um, having unpeated whiskies that are not easily distinguishable as Isla whiskies in their own right. And, and I understand that when producers are trying to be all things to all men, perhaps you could argue, when they're trying to have a fully um, uh, fitted out a fully representative range of Scot Scotch whiskies. Um, you know, they're doing finishes, they're doing um, various uh, styles, they're doing, you know, everything to have a full range. So it's obvious that they would start to speak like that. And he goes on to say, to say, look, no customers walk into a bar and ask for a whiskey that only uses waters from granite hillsides in the production. Again, I, okay, but I'm sure that, that that same ambassador would applaud tasting notes. And nobody's going to walk in to a bar and say, oh, could I have a whiskey that tastes of a candied lemon peel and a ripe tropical banana, please? Mm -hmm. it, 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 nobody is going to ask for whiskey in that way. Uh, sometimes things are put into play, in place and very quickly other things come along and that becomes more fashionable to talk about and it kind of people start to distance them, some, themselves from something that was very useful to them very recently and I, I don't think that's necessary I, I still like the concept of regionality I don't expect you guys to agree with me but I want to share with you why I think regions are still a good thing everyone has seen terroir barley water uh, peat used to dry barley potentially yes uh, climate and dunnage warehouses and maybe yeast. I would say the climate in a Dunnage warehouse, no, I think that that is very much location. Very much location and not so much of the earth. But it's open to interpretation, never went absolutely. Uh, Kilco Bryan is saying regions to help me as a storytelling background and a way to differentiate styles somewhat. It's part of the storytelling aspect that many whiskies have for me. Do you know, you, you're, you're getting close to what it is for me, Brian. Chris Amir is saying, I'm like Mark from Scotch for Dummies. Love them all. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Mark Broder, the whiskey hooer, commonly called the whiskey hooer. Uh, Menos Multimission is saying, I understand why regions can help newbies to be set on their way, but I feel it held me back personally very interesting. It held me back personally as I started out a peat head and complete disregard space side when I started out. That's not uncommon. Peat is one of the, the biggest, most obvious hook flavours in whiskey. And when people are struggling to distinguish flavours in whiskey, peat stands out and shouts clearly. And they can hold a peated whiskey against something that's unpeated and they get the difference. And that's very attractive. They enjoy the flavour of the peat and they enjoy the, the way the whiskey is communicating with them and their palate. 
And as time goes on, they start to appreciate more nuanced flavours and traits inside whiskey. It's just my belief, of course. But I very much feel that that's what's happened amongst my friends. The vast majority of my friends that have been converted to whiskey came into whiskey through a peated style, which is not often um, reported as being common. It's more, it's less likely to happen. However, that's how it worked out for a lot of my friends. I get what you're saying, Menno, that probably what happened there is that you got into peated whiskey. You decided, that's what I like. And because you knew that the other regions, I'm, I'm imagining that when you talk about peated whiskey, it was maybe islas that you were exploring. And the other regions that weren't known for peated whiskies, you held back from exploring. That's a real thing. And it happens the other direction as well. People stay away from peat, or people perhaps even stay away from Isla whiskies in general, or Western Highland whiskies, or Northern Highland, because they they believe, or somebody's told them at some point in time, that the peat is there, and that's maybe off-putting to them. But what it does do is it gives us a reference point. So we know if you were to give Isla a classic example of an Isla would clearly be something, probably we would choose something from the southern coast of Isla, one of the, the southern three, uh, Ardbeg, Lagavulin or Laphroaig. Heavily, heavily peated whiskey. And we would propose that in a lineup is what represents Isla and peat. If we took, if we put one in a flight from Campbelltown, we would choose something that was rich and challenging and characterful and funky and also something that doesn't necessarily always want to adhere to the styles that are defined in the other regions, and we would put that forward as um, an example of Campbelltown. So clearly, actually, any of the Campbelltown distilleries have product that fulfilled that role, actually. If you went to Speyside, you would perhaps be drawn to something kind of honeyed and rich and sweet, and certainly with a, a chunk of sherry influence in there as well. And if there was any peat in there, you would only want it to be the slightest distant puff of smoke. So you would be drawn to something along the lines of perhaps a Bilveni, an Aberlour, a Glenfarclas, a Macallan, whatever it may be. Um, if you wanted a Highland, you would be looking for something, a, a kind of more floral honeyed style, something with a, a maybe a bit of salinity, a, maybe a coastal Highland or something like, like that, or uh, something uh, sweetly honeyed like a, a Dalwini. Um, maybe something a wee bit more challenging like an old Pulteney or a Klein Leash or something that would maybe fill your highland spot in there and then your lowland spot well there's not much to choose from lowland is there there's ochentoshin there's glen kinchy there's bladnock there's a few out there daft mill if you can find it uh, there's more coming along um by the year there are, there are more coming along but you would probably be looking for something that represents this concept of what a lowland style should be so that kind of more grassy element, that lighter, fresher, brighter, maybe even some of them historically would have been uh, triple distilled. So maybe like uh, from Springbank, they obviously do a triple burn, a triple distilled hazel burn, but that's not a Lowlander, it's a Campbelltown. So we would obviously be drawn maybe to an Ochentoshin, maybe from an independent bottler, or perhaps a Glen Kinchy, or something that was representative of that style. What that does is then it gives you that reference point and you've broken down that hugely um, intimidating landscape of Scotch whisky and all its variation and all its brands and all its regions and all its distilleries. And you've broken it down into five big manageable chunks with the caveat that they all vary. And it's not definitive, but it gives you a hook and it gives you almost like these stepping stones that you feel a wee bit comfortable about just to give you a point of reference. And if you can become familiar with those styles, I think it's quite a nice way to lead somebody on their journey, all the while reminding them, well, Venny, there's a peat week um, that are unpeated islas. Most producers out there, as the years tick by, are doing more and more variation and it's becoming more complex. But does that mean that that regionality is becoming any less relevant? Perhaps, but it doesn't make it redundant. Regions in Scotland 
exist because of history, because of legislation, because of uh, railways and logistics and um, shipping routes and all of these things, uh, legislation, taxation, all of these things played a part in defining regions and Scotch whisky to the point that when blenders started to make whisky in the late uh, 19th century, they would clearly have distilleries defined that often fell into this regional categorization. And they would be making their blends based on regionality. Kelko is saying the idea of regions in the USA has been coming up as of late. It's something to notice how it's being debated when it seems clear that there is a difference by regions in the USA. People are already talking about that, that distinctive um, flavour, that distinctive tell that exists in a lot of Texas whiskies. Nobody has designed that or tried to put it in there, but it's coming through. And people that understand and taste more American whiskies than I do stand by it and say this tastes like a typical Texas whiskey, just as an example. Be very interested if you feel the same. Tristan History is saying, I don't think all regions made equal. Campbelltown, Island, Speyside say something more meaningful than Highland and Lowland, which are based on a line the tax man drew after all. Exactly what I'm talking about, Tristan, that Highland Lowland thing about ex entirely about controlling uh, distribution and uh, controlling whiskey production. Um, that was the original concept of the Highland line and it was changed over time, of course. Um, but that was one of the things that de defined the difference between Highland and Lowland whiskies. Highland whiskies being made by malt, small batch pot still. Lowland whiskies obviously benefiting from that industrial uh, belt in the lowlands, um, industrial fuel supply and coal, um, industrial uh, logistics and shipping routes. Um, they were making things uh, very efficiently um, in high quantities and ended up developing a much purer, cleaner, lighter, not to everybody's palate, better quality, um, but a different style in the lowlands. And as a consequence of that, despite the highlands being taxed to the point of being far more expensive and, and actually illegal at points in history, it was still <clears throat> in high demand because of its reputation. Back then, it wasn't known as Speyside. It was known as Glenlivet. So Aberlour, Glenlivet. You know, they all had the Glenlivet suffix. As far south as Edredour, which is a southern highland nowadays, but there has been times in history where there was an Edredour, Glenlivet, and they were all playing off the back of the reputation that that Glenlivet whiskey enjoyed historically. Um, but interesting that you talk about all regions not being made equal. I think Highlands very, very often challenge to be my favourite style of whisky. Um, not all the time, but there are a few up there that, that I love dearly. Whisky tends to absorb the flavour of the environment, which can help distinguish regions of whisky influencers are saying. So they're leaning a wee bit on the, that concept of location, uh, if it's matured near the sea, if it's uh, matured in a, uh, a very damp, blowy oceanic climate. Um, maybe altitude's got something to do with it as well, uh, depending on the flora and fauna that surrounds the distillery, all of these things. And there's a well-known thing that despite a distiller's best efforts and what he wants to design as his output, sometimes the output has a habit of taking care of itself. And they, they sometimes shrug, it even says in this article, they simply shrug and say, we don't know. That's kind of cool. I enjoy that about whiskey, but that's the kind of uh, naive, uh, romantic in me. Thomas Elmer is saying, why do Lowland whiskies uh, not have the cash the other regions have? Again, it's a legacy thing. You know, when, when whiskey went downhill fast, the big casualties were the big bulk producing lowland whiskey distilleries. Mm -hmm. um, when there was a lot of um, a consolidation of whiskey producers, uh, you know, that was the first to get hit. You've got to remember that in the lowlands, they were using any grain. So uh, even, even malt whiskey from the lowlands at times in the past has been des described as malt while using two thirds alternate grains and only perhaps somewhere a quarter or a third malt barley. So the, the reputation 
suffered a little bit as well because the flavour honestly comes from barley. It comes from malt whiskey, the majority of the flavour. Um, in modern times, uh, a grain whiskey uh, uh, that's made from wheat or corn, whatever it may be, tends to give a nice base. A non-challenging canvas, a blank canvas, let's say, alcohol canvas to build um, a blend on by adding flavours provided by malt whiskey. And that was whiskey for over 100 years. And it's only in the last 40, 50 years that malts really started to gain traction um, as a, in a category in their own right and, and offer people the definition that drinking and enjoying malt whiskey and that flavour um, and enjoying what that can provide. Man, I was saying, let's take an account that if Cochrane wasn't resurrected, Campbelltown would now probably be part of the Lowlands because there'd only be two active distilleries. Yes, I've never got to the bottom of that story. I've asked people in the industry about that. Was Cochrane, did that come around simply because, uh, you know, Mitchell, uh, Mitchell's, uh, the owners of Springbank, wanted to preserve the region of Campbelltown? Um, was that a real danger? Um, and I've heard both sides of the story, and I'm not sure which one to believe. I'm just happy that Campbelltown is a region in its own right. I'm happy that Glengyle, Kilcarran exists. I'm happy that Glen Scotia is there. I'm happy that the stuff that Glen Scotia's put out recently, I'm happy that Springbank continue to do very, very engaging, enjoyable, natural things too. Um, but there was a time that Campbelltown was the ugly whiskey producer. There was 30 distilleries in Campbelltown and they became known for making anything you wanted as cheaply as possible um, with very much a focus on quantity and efficiency rather than quality. So it was a price point thing on a bulk scale and it lost uh, a lot of reputation and uh, uh, they suffered, Campbelltown suffered. I mean, there's a point in our very recent history that, that there was literally only one or two part-time distilleries operating in Campbelltown. Um, so it's great that it still is a region. Uh, trying to catch the chat here. Paul Gibbs, Aquavita Grant at Springbank said exactly that. Grant was one of the guys that I asked, actually. Um, very interesting, Paul. Good guy, Grant, a really good guy. Um, you know, I'm surprised how much I'm enjoying that Glen Caddam Portwood. Um, it's a triple cask Portwood to finish. Very tasty tonight. Just the mood I'm in, just the way things are tasting tonight. Uh, one of the things I talked to Mark Rainier today as well is about tasting and appreciating whiskey and, and, he talk, and he brought up the fact, and I've heard this from so many people, that your palate is at, at its optimum, optimum in the late morning. Um, and by the time you're in the evening, you've been eating a lot of food throughout the day, maybe your palate's a bit saturated, a bit tired and things, and what, enjoying whiskey or analysing whiskey or trying to extract um, the maximum amount of tasting notes or nuance out of whiskey. It's going to be taxed a little bit late in the day and he talked about it being late morning and it struck me again that I wish I had a job or a role in life that I could sit in the late morning and enjoy whiskey but unfortunately like so many of you out there we don't. Paul Gibbs saying in 2018 Glen Gale only ran the stills for three weeks a year. Wow I didn't appreciate it, it was only three weeks uh, during 2018. Um, I, I certainly I knew it was part time, but I didn't know it was as, as little as three weeks. It's quite amazing. Whiskey novice Jim is saying, are we in danger of oversaturating the Scotch whiskey regions? There seem to be so many new distilleries opening, uh, but is the demand there? We talk about it a lot, Jim. We talk about it on these VPUBs and live streams and things. Um, we saturate in terms of brands, names, new releases, uh, new expressions. More and more and more are hitting the market all the time. But if we talk about saturation, uh, we need to distinguish between uh, variation, various brands and expressions, and volume. If you add up all the new distilleries, you don't even get them to add up to the size of one expansion in capacity from one of the big three, McAllen, Glenlivet, or Glenfiddich. 
So when we talk about uh, whiskey production and scale, and I'm not talking about grain producers here, I'm not talking about um, column still production, not talking about grain whiskey, I'm talking about malt. Add up all the new distilleries and, you know, Glenfiddich going from 12 million a year to 20 million, McAllen going from eight or nine to 15, uh, Glenlivet, they're up at 20 plus million theoretical capacity, uh, million liters of per annum. All of these new distilleries can't even match one of those expansion programs. So I don't think we're, we're in danger of uh, saturating in terms of volume, but they are all going to have a huge challenge. They can't all be a daft mill where there's going to be that pent up demand when there hasn't been a lot of new whiskies out for a long time, they're all going to hit the market around about the same time in the next few years. And actually it started happening now already in the last couple of years. And they're all going to struggle to get traction. Their inaugural releases will often get a lot of interest and a bit of fanfare. People will go out and buy those. The challenge is going to come bringing out a good whiskey that's going to make people go back and buy the second and third bottles and future expressions, much like has happened at Daft Mill. Um, Emily McGill saying it comes down to where the flavour comes from. Even in white dog whiskey, you could argue there is no terroir. It all comes down to the barrel and storage location. I think maturation and the location of maturation is crucial. It's very influential. Um, but I have read and heard things recently that's making me consider and be mindful, more and more mindful of barley. Maybe varietals, maybe not. Certainly how and where and what year under what conditions in barley has been grown. Jimmy Legacy like saying, analysing whiskey is not something I enjoy. When a flavour or scent comes to me, I love it. But searching for them removes some enjoyment for me. Jimmy, most of the time I'm in that zone. I'm very much the same. But as time goes on in whiskey, more and more, you know, the whiskey tends to speak a wee bit more to you and things jump out as you're sipping it and it's distracting you. Um, even when you're in a social situation, you're sipping it and you're, oh, and it calls to you a little bit. And I find that that's happens to me. But sometimes when I'm on my own and I'm just sitting relaxing with the whiskey, what's more to do than contemplate your thoughts and contemplate the glass in front of you? And you don't need to go searching and you don't need to tax or tire yourself. But it's nice to just consider, wow, this is buttery. This is fruity. This is spicy. This is something, just something. And then as you sit with it and you let it sit on your palate and then you think about it as you, I get stacks of pleasure out of it. And I know that I'm starting to sound like a geek. Gregor is saying, Gregor, so good to see you. And he's saying, Gregor, I guess Gregor McQueen. Um, what is on the horizon for Aquavita YouTube channel this year. Let's see your whiskey dick goals for the year. The STDs will be back over in Bonnie before those vids magic themselves up. You put me under a bit of pressure there, Gregor McQuee. Um, I'm not the type who sets a lot of goals. Um, and, and in case I haven't been clear, I'm sure I've been clear in the past about this. It's very much um, whiskey fitting around my life when it can when, when I can accommodate it, and I think it should be like that for everybody. For me, it's always family, then the day job, the thing that pays the money, um, and then whiskey fits around that. As time's going on, whiskey's becoming more and more of a priority for me. Um, and I'm kind of managing to gradually reshape my life to accommodate it more and more. But am I at the point where I sit down and make a list of goals for the year? Talk to my wife about that. Uh, I'm just not the type. Um, but I do have plans. And uh, as you know, Gregor, I tend to share those plans uh, within Patreon first. Zach Andrews is saying, thanks for another great topic. Cheers, Roy. Got to run. Watch the rest on the live stream later, Zach. So glad that you were able to drop in. I hope you haven't been skiving too much from work, my friend. I know you're over there in Texas. So i you, Zach, and thanks for stopping by. Menno is saying, what do you do you think the increased amount of what's available from Scotch, Ireland, America and the rest of the world will help slow down the crazy inflation we had the last few years? Nice lead in to the next topic. Where are we? We're an hour in and I haven't even confessed yet. And I know this is going to be the controversial thing. Let me pour another dram as I share something with you. 
think I need something strong for this one, honestly. I've got Scott Monroe's Glenn Keith here, 58.2%, 23, sorry, 23 year old, yeah, 58.2% from Scott. I've got an Octomore Masterclass, 8.2, 8 year old at 58.4. Almost the same ABV from Marcus Kreitner. Um, let's go for an Octomore. I like the seals, Marcus. They look quite challenging to get into. And I don't have a, a blade, do I? If I don't have a blade, I could forgo the... Oh, my packaging materials has been moved elsewhere. So if I can't get into this, my friend, I might not get to enjoy an Octomore tonight. Is it a brute force thing? Yeah. There we go. Wow, quite a dark Octomore. Oh, wow. My goodness. Um, I read about this when it came out, but I haven't uh, retained any of the information. But uh, that's already jumping out the glass. Uh, Matthew said you have a Dolmonic at 64.5%. I do, Matthew. Thank you so much. <laughs> and Baggy's saying, you've been a bad boy, Roy. The Whiskey Friend is saying, here we go. Jimmy Legge is saying, I don't even want you to bring up the Mac. Um, I, I think I do want to bring it up because I think not only do I want to uh, talk about it openly, to talk about the motivations, to talk about uh, how that whole thing came about, um, but I want to talk about the end result. And it's not like I couldn't have warned myself about it because it didn't end up well. Um, I've been talking for some time about how prices have been softening generally across Europe. You're seeing prices remaining, uh, okay, nothing is cheap. Nothing's becoming cheap, but prices are freezing a little bit in a lot of ranges, a lot of uh, producers, a lot of distributors. You're seeing discounting happening. Uh, you're seeing, for us in the UK, the biggest barometer would probably be auctions. And I have used auctions for years, but I have never, ever sold a bottle at auction. Whiskey Novice Jim has said, I appreciate your opinion as always, mate. Here till the end of your shift, but just wanted to show some support. Jim, you star. But what you're going to do is you're going to make me jump into this. Oh, no, I've got a wee bit of the Glen Caddam left to raise my glass and say, slant you, Jim. Thank you. I have never sold a bottle at auction. And I walked in there to talk to them about selling a bottle. How do I do it? And they say, well, you need to open an account with this and things. I said, oh, okay, I don't have an account, so maybe next time. And he said, well, will you buy from us? And I said, yes. He said, well, that's enough. So that's how easy it is. You hand the bottle over. They give you a, a, a docket for it, a handwritten thing. It goes into the auction. Um, you can log into your account and you can watch it. So that happened for me this month for the first time ever. And I've, I've had uh, bottles here that I've had for a while that I just don't have space anymore for. There's only so much weight a shelf can take. There's only so much bottles you can cram in a cupboard and then you get to the point where it's ridiculous because you don't have the liver and even when you're sharing like a crazy man you can't even share it enough and i realized that there were bottles that i was keeping just for the comfort of owning a bottle i, I can't even say you know oh no i was keeping it because i was keeping it as a future investment mm -hmm. i always had that in my, in my head that i would be able to liquidate it in the future if i wanted to but that wasn't the plan. I was these bottles I was keeping were bottles, backup bottles that I enjoyed years ago, or things that I was collecting because I knew they would be nice, or they might be a nice topic in a, a live or a VPUB or, a, or or just something to open with somebody one day, and it never comes. And I'm self-employed now, and cash flow is becoming an issue, and they're like, "Why? Well, I can't." It's time to ref refresh things and clear out. So auctions had been in my mind for a little while. I had to take some of these bottles and thin out. But on the way back from Germany last year, I got an email from McAllen to say I'd been successful in a ballot. Now, for two years or more, I've been entering all the McAllen ballots, and I've never had a sniff, to the point that I was becoming paranoid that McAllen was ignoring me and there was never going to be anything that I would win. 
And this wasn't because I wanted to win the whiskey and enjoy it and drink it. Despite the high scores that McAllen enjoys on whiskey base, for example, it, it does, especially the special releases. If I had the opportunity to buy from McAllen, I would be making the decision based on could I sell it on? And if I got a bottle from McAllen and sold it on, I might have been able to achieve a dream of mine, and that would be to afford or to justify or somehow get my hands on a mid or early 70s brewer. That's, that's all I've kind of wanted. It's, it's just my dream uh, distillery, my dream bottling would be that brewer, but it's minimum four figures, but actually it's got a lot more than that now for the right expression. Sam Zaid is, is, I don't know if I'm pronouncing your name right, Sam. Um, he said, Happy New Year, Roy. I keep wanting to try all these whiskies, but I have 100 plus bottles. How much is too much and how many to buy a year? It's a very personal thing, really, and it depends on how you're getting through whiskey. Are you doing it kind of on your own? Are you sharing it with a lot of people? Um, I guarantee you, if you start sharing it with a lot of people, what will happen to you that has happened to me is that the people you share it with end up with their own collections. So the sharing starts to become a bi-directional thing and you don't go through it as much and you start to build up. And And I think that's what's happening to a lot of folk out there. They're building more and more. And I think that's got a lot to do with the softening of prices and auction. Perhaps it's starting to flow back out of the collections and back onto the market again. Anyway, I digress. Oh, Sam, thank you so much for your virtual drama, my friend. Thank you. Let's get the confession out there. So I had the opportunity to take this or leave this McAllen and pay the money or not. And I said, no, I'm going to go, I'm going to do it. £750. This was an Easter Elche's Black 2019 release. I have never spent £750 on a whiskey in my life. I've never even spent £750 on a batch of whiskies. £750 is a bunch of that's not true i spent more than that when i bought a lot of whiskies from a fellow member at the club who was getting rid of his collection to go on to other projects um but that was to buy a lot of whiskies at a time that i didn't have a lot of whiskies now i have a lot of whiskies but i thought about it and i thought wait it's mccallan what's the worst thing that can happen I thought that was my wife uh, trying to get me there. Um, it's McAllen. Surely the worst that can happen is that I'll get my money back. So even though it was £750 and I faltered for a little bit, I went with it. And, and from the minute I went with it, I wasn't sure it was the right thing to do. And I convinced myself and I convinced my wife that it was the right thing to do. And sure enough, it was delivered here, and it was a beautifully presented thing, a wonderful thing to look at, but it went straight back in the box. It's not my whiskey. And it went off to auction, and it went into auction, and I pulled up the account, and it was watching a kettle boiling, watching the prices on auction. But it was worse, because when you watch a kettle boiling, if you watch it long enough, it will boil. But this Macallan, it, it wasn't there wasn't any bids coming in on it. It was it was crazy. And then I searched the auction for McAllen Easter Elches and there was 101 bottles. Now, admittedly, that was not all 2019 release. Some of that was older stuff, but 90% of that 101, 90 bottles there or thereabouts, was the same thing I was selling. And I realized that there's no information from McAllen how many bottles there are. And there were people who were literally putting down their delivery dress from McAllen as, as the auction site. Okay, so alarm bells start to ring a little bit. Um, and to cut to the chase, when the auction finished, my bottle of McAllen sold for £650. I lost £100 on that bottle of whiskey. Now, what's interesting is the 650 was the highest bid of any of the lots. 650 seemed to be where it topped out. There were some people that only made 600 or 580 or I think 580 was maybe the lowest. I didn't check thoroughly. But that just shows you that's McAllen. That's a special release from McAllen. I don't know how much 2018 Easter Elches was, um, but 2019 at 750 is clearly far too expensive. And, and McAllen has have taken the piss to the point that it's now biting them back. 
How many people are going to queue up for a ballot next time? Perhaps they'll still do fine. Perhaps they'll continue on their merry way. But surely that's another flag, another thing to tell us that it's changing, the dynamic is changing, the prices are starting to saturate. And if we've pushed it to the point that it's starting to bounce back now, we might not be able to control how far it bounces back, how much the prices will continue to soften. Worry not a jot. If you're a drinker, if you're somebody that collects bottles as a selection to open and share one day to enjoy, you've got nothing to worry about because that is intact. And the softening prices means that they fall, it all falls back into the lap of the drinker. My takeaway from this, I am not a canny speculator or seller of whiskey. That's me kind of put my toe in the water to think, oh, I could do something here. I could get my hands on a brora at some point. Um, that's not how it's going to happen for me. I'm going to have to be a bit more uh, structured and just save and be a bit more canny about it. It's not going to come as easily as that. And it's not something that I want to get involved in. Um, but maybe I had to lose £100 in a single bottle <laughs> to learn that lesson. Um, and the other bottles that I sold at auction, if I sat there and tried to remember what I paid for them back when I bought them and work out all of that, I, I, I don't think over the course, I don't think they've lost me anything. Perhaps they've softened it, that loss or, or retrieved it for me fully, I don't know. Um, but the McAllen, um, Orange Willis saying McAllen fatigue could be true. I want to, I, I posted this and I shared this as on a little post that I put on uh, Patreon for, for the Patreon folk. And I got some uh, nice feedback and comments from, from those guys and food for thought. Uh, this is from Malcolm Douglas. He's saying, I wouldn't have a clue about flipping uh, and he wouldn't have the balls to do it. The money he spent in the last 12 months on standard releases is already frightening. And he says he'd be kicked out in his arse if he lost money on them. He's talking about his wife, perhaps. He said, I started my collection to learn, drink, enjoy and share. But I also as a retirement investment for when the money stopped coming in, much of what I have are second bottles I bought after really enjoying the first. And these are for later when I'm poor. It's very much the mentality I had and perhaps still have, actually, Malcolm. I had thought of holding on to things like daff mill, teapots and our bags for spending power later, but I soon realised that if I didn't open them, I'd miss something that I just don't get with a sample, absolutely. And that is getting to know them. So, and then he makes a joke. He says he has a daff mill 2008 summer with bids starting at £475, 57 pence, but you better be quick because he keeps fiddling with the cork. I get exactly where you're coming from, Malcolm, and and I think that you it could very quickly get in a position with me that unless you're much more measured about what you buy and buy as a doubler to give yourself uh, that comfort of not being able to finish that bottle with impunity, knowing that you have a backup to continue enjoying it. Sometimes I'm starting to work out that it might be nice just to put it down to memory and allow the whiskey to become even better in a memory as I remember it and know that maybe you don't always have the luxury of keeping it, right? Um, uh, this this one is from Blair, actually, from Blair, from Jimmy Legg. He said, it seems to me that if you're a person of integrity, maybe this is extreme integrity, you'd steer clear of the folks who are obviously screwing people over. He's referring to, he said, that is McAllen and of anyone who profits from what McAllen does. Too much, he said, he does have a serious anti McAllen streak in me. And Scott Secker replied to that comment saying, uh, me too, was seriously underwhelmed by their distillery. Brilliant building, but two of six of the six pillars demos didn't work. And the samples were insipid. There are better things to spend your money on. I fell for the 2018 Easter Elche's Black, but it was a moment of madness. I won't sell it for some time, but I catch myself asking how much did I spend on Nass. It's exactly the feeling I had after I bought it. And I probably knew that I had uh, exposed myself a little bit. Our baggy is saying half flipping Hellroy. I like your pun, Andy. He's saying I've never flipped bottles less than five years <laughs> in my stash. And only did a few hundred to clear some space. Andy's been uh, enjoying whiskey and sharing whiskey for it seems like half a century. I know he's not that old. Um, but he said uh, 10 Hail Marys We'll do it. See you in the beep up. 
That made me laugh, Andy. Thanks very much for the comment. And uh, James's art room said, so McAllen have a ballot for the privilege, and he puts privilege clearly in inverted commas, of purchasing a bottle of their overpriced whiskey. I'm staggered by that. Flip away, I say. Well, flip away if you think you can make money out of it. But here, please take what I did as a warning um, to be a bit more canny about it than I was. <sighs> 11 o'clock. Hit me. Judge me. What do you think about me confessing that I succumbed and became uh, a green-eyed monster uh, looking for easy money? That's not how I enjoy whiskey. Men was saying, ouch, how long did you have to sleep on the, co the, co the couch I imagine he's talking about? Um, I I told my wife about it. She knew that it was in the auction. She was watching the prices the same as me. Uh, she's pragmatic. I hope <laughs> she's been pragmatic thus far. The whiskey friend Alan saying you could have reserved it 750. Actually, when I put it in at the auction, it was suggested that that wasn't the done thing. Uh, but when I saw the amount of, there was a lot of them out there uh, and you pay extra money for the reserve. I think it was 10 pounds a bottle. Uh, but the feeling with it being a Macallan is that uh, pff, nobody reserves put reserves on a Macallan. But there was a lot of them uh, that were reserved. But even then, you're losing uh, money, but a lot less. And I guess that a lot of people that have reserved and put the ten pounds reserve on might even just keep it in the auction and put it up again next month and a month after. I don't know, hoping that it bobs back. And it may indeed come back. Um, but I didn't put a reserve on it. And maybe you're right, Alan. Maybe I should have. Whiskey Jason is saying, my tip: buy the bottle. And wait a year, then enter it into the auction. Usually much better prices then. Could be true. I'm out of it. I'm going to use auctions to buy things that I'm after, Jason. Uh, I am not in a hurry. If I maybe have to do a year down the line, two years down the line, do a we weeding out thing again where I'm clearing out some things that I, um, I don't really need anymore or I feel like I can do without, then I'll maybe go back to the auction selling again, but not with that uh, intensity, not with that um, dynamic. Um, Scott is saying 2018 is just making 750 at auction. So last year's was only making 750. Wow. It's the constant flippers that have bumped it. Good value for drinkers. I hope that that continues. That, you know, the, the market stays vibrant, but it stays a bit more appropriate and it falls back into the laps of drinkers, as I keep talking about. Um, Uh, Jimmy Legg is, is quite vehement. He's saying, I hope McAllen never makes another dollar. That's how much I love them to how much I know. I think I've been clear about it. McAllen isn't targeted at us anymore. And it has been for a long time. Malcolm Douglas is saying, did you enter anything else? Yes. As I, as I mentioned, Malcolm, you'll hear, uh, if you listen to it back again, I did uh, put some uh, assorted uh, bottles in there. Ben is saying bedtime now. Love the blind tasting. Watch on repeat with Maltmate, and we had three equivalent drams. Turned into a brilliant alternative tasting. My friend is now a Kilkerran disciple. Good for you, Ben. Um, and uh, thanks very much for letting me know that you enjoyed it. So let's talk about December. I did weekly uh, live streams again last December, the same as I did in 2018. I started off with uh, talking about Kilkerran, being my producer of 2019. Um, lots of people echoed my sentiments on Kilkerran generally. It's very popular with the community right now. Um, uh, you can just about get most of the expressions, not them all. 15-year-old, uh, almost impossible now. Eight-year-old, uh, most recent, uh, eight-year-old cast strength is becoming impossible. But Kilkerran, you can still uh, get your hands on and the prices are appropriate most of the time. Then I followed it up with a, a wonderful stream that I really, really enjoyed with uh, Roddy. Um, Roddy, a local guy from Glasgow here as well, Roddy Graham. Everybody, the feedback that that live stream got was super positive. The comments on that live stream is wonderful to read. Love it. Um, I, I hope Roddy got to enjoy a lot of those uh, comments as well. A lot of them were about uh, specifically his presence. And uh, uh, if Roddy is willing, I guarantee it won't be the last time that Roddy joins me. Um, all we have to do is find an appropriate subject matter to talk about and he'd be welcome here any time, and I know that you guys would enjoy that too. Then we went on to do the, the quite complex a uh, blind tasting thing, and the only negative feedback I got about that was, oh, there's a lot of people involved at the same time. But I think that, that was a necessary dynamic to an extent because I didn't want it just to be two or three 
opinions. I wanted there to be a, a kind of larger sample so that I could recognise if there were any patterns that came out, much like the live tasting I did in Glasgow at the end of last year. I wanted it to be a similar sample set. So I was looking for seven or eight participants, uh, the same as in Glasgow. Um, but it was I really enjoyed doing it. I really enjoyed doing the, the blind challenge. And if you're up for it, it won't be the last time I do it again. I'll, I'll try and uh, refine it and try and do it uh, maybe later in the year. Um, it might not be a, a common thing. It might be something I do perhaps as an annual event, I think. Um, and then uh, what turned out to be a very, very enjoyable evening for me is that uh, I invited uh, two guys very local to me, uh, friends of mine, local uh, uh, in the, the community, Barflies, Sevy the Alchemist and Kilted Moose Scott over here um, and just asked them. I, I, said to, I said, you can come here and I know you want to bring whiskey. If you do bring whiskey, bring one whiskey only for sharing. It's a bit like bringing coals to Newcastle. Don't bring whiskey here. You're coming here to drink my whiskey. And they sat, and when I was checking in on them throughout the live stream, they were helping themselves to my collection. And um, I was always curious to see what they had uh, found and opened and what they were pouring and sharing. But, of course, they joined me in the end. It became clear that they were actually in this house with me at the end of the stream. And that was great fun. And after the live stream, we got to sit here and watch the other live streams that were going on after that and hang out a little bit and just enjoy each other's company in real life. And that was great fun. And I honestly, I can't think of a better way to have ended 2019 than with all of you guys and to have them sitting next to me. Uh, Warner, the one glass man is saying, Roy, have a dram on my behalf to help erase the pain, my friend. <laughs> no pain. Let's, uh, lesson learned, nothing to talk about. Warner, thank you so much for your dram. Slanjava. Anyway, it's in here, late to the VPUB. Uh, oh, wow, I've just had a sip of the Octomore, subconsciously. My goodness, what is happening there? Very, very different. No idea what the makeup, there's wine in here. There's certainly some kind of wine, finishes wine, mature product. I don't know what's in here, I really don't. It's the Masterclass uh, 8.2. I don't pay a lot of attention to Octomore, if I'm honest. Not out of protest or anything. Um, I do find them a bit expensive. Uh, honestly, I think the cheapest Octomore I've seen when... Um, the cheapest Octomore I saw when I was at Brookladdy was £125. So that's the joining price for Octomores. Um, I appreciate that it's... Uh, Special release, batch, low production quantities, but I always find it a wee bit pricey. Um, having said that, if I enjoyed it, I would probably buy some, but I've never actually had any that particularly hey, nudged me into spending that kind of money. Marcus Kreitner is saying, we're wine finished, Austrian sweet wine too. Ah, it makes sense, Marcus, you're in Austria. That's why I got it, because I only paid €110 Euro for it. Wow. For this one as well, because it's uh, an eight-year-old. Interesting that the thing that shouts loudest there is the wine, shouting louder than the peat. Can be common for me. My palate is, it finds it very easy to cancel out, Pete. Whiskey Radar is saying that Octomore has Amarone casks in it. So Amarone is a very specific, very powerful Italian wine. Could have a lot to do with it. Uh, Dancing Midgey is in St. Aquaviti. Thanks, Roy, for the introduction to Coquerin. Eight cast rent, 57.1. Managed to buy five bottles, two to drink, three to put away. Absolutely love it. Ah, ah people will breaking at your house to get, everybody's desperate to get their hands on that. I don't know where you're located in the world, dancing midgy, uh, the, uh, I feel like you must be in Scotland or you're, you're a Scot, consider releasing a couple of bottles back into the wild to fellow barflies maybe. Um, they're really struggling to get their hands on that just now, but I'm really glad that you're enjoying it. It's a fantastic dram and it's easy to see, I think, why you've 
bought that many because it is that good, but also that it's affordable for cast strength deliciousness. Jens is in, Jens Roger Christofferson, good to see Jens. Uh, more Vedre, Sautern, sweet wine, and Amarone. Wow, it's a wine fest. Danny Vermas is saying uh, the exact same. He's uh, echoing your thoughts, Jens. And Razvan uh, Dombrava is saying, have you tried any of the Brugladi uh, beer barley releases? I've actually got one here. Uh, that My option call, I kept it because uh, I've only had uh, samples of the beer barley and I enjoyed quite a few drams of it when I was over in Isla. And I knew he was enjoying it and I bought it and brought it back. Uh, I have a, a friend from California, Bill. Uh, we, we both enjoyed that when we were in Isla and I think that that's going to be kept here. And we'll open that together when I next see Bill from California. Um, but Razvan is saying, I will try it in the next weeks. Actually really enjoyed it. Really enjoyed it. I, I bought a bottle. Um, fantastic. Uh, there is a quiz tonight. So if anybody's up for the quiz, we're well, not impressed how quickly I get through the quiz. It just shows that it can be done in about 10 minutes or so, or 10 or 15 minutes. And I do probably drag it out as I drag out everything. Hey, but I thank you for your patience. I wonder if we want to tackle a teapot comparison here. Because while we're talking about prices, I chucked my toys out of the pram a wee bit for, on Glen Goyne because I applauded them for this. In 2018, no, to 2018, yes, they released this batch six at the same price as the previous batch, which I thought for a whiskey of this style and type was already trading at the upper level of what it was worth in terms of an engagement prospect, in terms of uh, the age of the whiskey and things like that. But it's very, very hand-selected. It's very deliberated over, put a lot of effort in it. It's only five or so casks at a time. And they put together something that's very special just to produce three, 4,000 bottles. Very limited release, only available through their online store and the distillery with a very interesting, nice backstory to talk about the concept of the teapot dram, the days of dramming when whiskey was dished out at the distillery. All wonderful stuff. But the big deal about this was just how bold, powerful, engaging and wonderful a whiskey this was. Batch by batch, some were better than others. Some people prefer these, some people prefer these, backwards and forwards. There's all sorts of debate. Oh, the first one was the best. The last one was the best. Typical nonsense that you get with whiskey. But they're all engaging and good whiskies. 90 pounds. And I applauded them for it. I was excited under the VPUB live stream to talk about batch six when it came out. Fast forward to 2019, batch seven comes along. We're going to check it out and it's... Uh, £120, right? £120, I think it came out at. Um, yeah, 33% more expensive, £120. I gasped. Okay, maybe it's much older. Maybe there's a story, maybe there's a reason, maybe there's a thing. And yeah, they talked about having put older stocks in. Um, what was the reason for that? Mm, to make it better, uh, because they didn't have stocks that's more in line with the original concept of this originally because they wanted to bring the ABV down be below 60%. I know that some export markets are sensitive to higher than 60% ABV. Who knows? There was, there was some casks that were a wee bit older that were in there. Okay. But what they've done is they've caused impassioned fans to pause and step back. And to this day, I haven't caved. I may go forward and buy Glen Goyne Teapot Dram Batch 7, but it's not a priority for me anymore when the previous batches have been. It's it's just such a jump in price. And just when everybody's jumping and the prices are jumping, the prices are jumping, I want to give myself the opportunity to miss out. And just some things, if it's for you, it doesn't go past you. So I paused and I didn't buy my batch seven. But Malcolm Douglas, my friend, did send me a dram. I'm going to get two clean glasses, actually, because he's sent me. And you see, this is open. The sample's open. And it's been open for a long time since way when I started to set up the stream. It's been open for a couple of hours anyway, because this bottle's been open for probably a year. Oh, I'm going to get a... 
a logo glass so I can keep track. And I'll pour uh, a sample of the batch seven in the logo glass. And I'll pour a wee drop of batch six in the clear glass. Now, I guarantee you I'm not going to get these confused with what's in the other clear glass, which is that Octomore. I know that people that have been watching uh, the Aquavite channel for a long time will pick up that I'm quite sensitive to wine finishes and whiskey, and it has to be quite um, quite nice and well-crafted, and um, it has to be a specific type of wine finish for me to really enjoy it. And I think the Octomore needs a wee bit more time in that glass for me to understand it a bit better. It's very, very wine-driven, wine-forward, very cask-forward. I guarantee you this teapot dram, batch seven, I guarantee you I'm going to love it. Am I going to 120 pounds love it? But I ask you, I ask the barflies out there in the lounge, consider the concept of teapot dram and give me another whiskey, any whiskey you like, that is equivalent to teapot dram. I think you'll find them because they are out there. But then I, tell me what the price is for the equivalent. I already can start to predict some of the some of the equivalents that you're going to bring to me. Now, this is not to let Glengoyne off the hook with £120 price. Um, but it remains, while it's not a unique whiskey, it remains quite a special whiskey. Am I going to be sitting here telling you it's worth £120? Batch six has been open a while. I loved it when I started to sip it. It's hotter. Um, okay, it's a hot whiskey anyway. This is high 50s. We're talking about 59.3%. But the ABV was similar to batch six. And I thought that uh, batch seven, sorry, batch five. I thought batch six played hotter on the palate uh, than batch five for me. Um, but it's, it's a fabulous whiskey. So let's uh let's go into batch seven. Daniel for my seen a Glen going cast strength with a few drops of Glen going twenty one, maybe that would do the trick. Not a chance. Whiskey influencer saying Deanston 23 all are also sherry reminded me a lot of teapot, obviously much older and probably around 150. All are also 23 year old Deanston all are also, I have it through there. It was a flatter experience. This is vibrant and jumpy and alive, and these are bizarre uh, concepts I'm sharing with you. Hardly professional tasting notes, but the, uh, the Deanston 23 year old all are also was much more round and soft and integrated um, a product of its age a product of its time it's the time what, what Deanston was producing 24 now years ago this is absolutely modern whiskey this is very vibrant this is quieter on the nose to me tonight um, bizarrely so where, where I'm getting lots of kind of nice bacon spices and cinnamons and things on the older one, and it might just be because it's uh, been in a wee sample bottle. No, it's there, the spice is there. Just a fantastic, rich, uh, spiced, uh, wet, Moist tobacco, like dates, and Shit. 
okay, between those two, I'm very reluctant to share that. I think that probably batch seven's got the nudge over six on the palette. That's just a, a gut initial reaction. I need to spend a wee bit of time with it. I think I'll cover these off. I'll put a couple of coins in here and uh, grab the dummies coin. I'm going to top these off and spend a bit of time with them after the stream. Gut reaction, yes, I think uh, batch seven is a wee bit is a wee bit nicer. 120 pounds, still not convinced. But I'd like to hear what your um Uh, Alistair Gray is saying similar to the original Aberlour Abuna. So you're talking about Aberlour Abuna. Uh, the Aberlour Abuna was very similar in style in terms of whiskey profile, but it was a much, much bigger batch. Aberlour Abuna was a much, much bigger uh, batch thing um, in terms uh, of, of vatting, whereas the teapot dram was only ever five casks of, of that order. Um, and Aberlour Abuna was a global release thing. Um, but yes, I think arguably uh, the Abuna could be um, the previous um, uh, batches of Abuna was probably uh, a close equivalent. But we're talking about a product that was originally 40, 50 pounds, uh, crept up to 60, and then it took a big jump up to the 80s and the 90 pounds in Aberlour Abuna. Um, but it was never... Uh, you know, Glen Goyne, uh, the teapot dram has always been slightly higher priced. Um, and Aberlour Abuna has become more expensive. And I think a lot of people backed off. A lot of the people that were enjoying Aberlour Abuna kind of looked elsewhere uh, once once the price has leapt up a bit. But I think Aberlour Abuna um, is still in demand. I don't buy it anymore. Whiskey and Flores are saying, is, is it 33% nicer? Um, I, I don't think so, not on first approach. Because, but, but it's not just about 33% nicer. It's not just about measuring the increment. It's it's about saying, is it, st is it 120 pounds worth of whiskey? That That's that's kind of where I'm coming from. And I don't, I don't, I'm not convinced that it is yet. As soon as something hits triple figures, it's kind of, it sticks a bit, does it not? I remember a time, and it wasn't that long ago, where anything ab above 50 or 60 pounds for me was used to stick. And I don't want to keep just giving in to these kind of crazy, this track that we're on, where we just go ahead and just spend money. It's, um, obviously, I'm just speaking about me, but um, I think it's at the most, it's worth, and most I'll pay Aquavita. If it goes up this year, I'll say farewell. So I know, Gregor, that you um, have picked up a, a batch seven. Um, and I don't think you're going to be disappointed. I think you're going to enjoy it. Um, uh, it was originally a Buna. I wonder, uh, Blair, if you're making a pun because Gaelic for a Buna is the original. <laughs> John Paul Vanderhoven is saying any Edradour natural cast strength twelve. Ah, well, uh, again, that's that's a slightly different thing. Um, does anybody else feel that Edradour is getting very very good recently? There was a time that Edradour, uh, depending on what you bought and from uh, what, let's say, period could be a real gamble. And you always had to kind of go on a recommendation or get a sample or try or something first for Edward Hour. Um, but I am getting the feeling um, that more and more people are starting to speak positively about Edward Hour, that it's uh, definitely one of those valid under the radar distilleries. Um, the, the folks in charge there now have been in charge long enough that most of the product they're putting out now is very much theirs, that they're taking responsibility for, less legacy things that they've inherited. Uh, less dead wood or distillate, that kind of thing. And I get the impression that Edward Dower is starting to show a lot of strength now. I'd be interested to hear what your input is. Um, and Jimmy, like I said, the first few batches of Abuna weren't large, were they? I'm not very sure what size, scope, scale they were. I'm not sure. Um, I sold, uh, one of the bottles that I sold at auction um, was an, an older um Aberlour Abuna. Whiskey Novice is saying, uh, holy shit, I'm right there now. £40 was a cut off then, 50%, etc., etc., getting scary. I know. Listen, we go along our whiskey journey, it inevitably leads us down that path. But we, as long as it's with a sense of awareness so that we know what we're getting into 
and then we can always kind of judge and measure uh, wherever we are. Emin McGill is saying the Caledonian 12 is great. It's an Edredour bottling. I have to agree with you. The Whiskey Rev he bought a bottle of that a couple of years back and, and we enjoyed it together. Um, I've not really been back, spent a lot of time with it since, but I have tried other Edredours recently. One of them was poured for me blind and I was really, really blown away. That was, that was, I wonder if that was one of the batch strength ones. Um, it was Sherry Cast, cast Strength. The Callan Final Rear, the Doc, good to see you, Doc. Always great to have you in. The past has demonstrated once greed surfaces, it gets dangerous, referring to whiskey price hikes in general. Um, I guess we could declare that it's a bit of a, a, a task for us all as a community to kind of keep each other in check and say, oh, I thought about this whiskey, but it's gone up in price or it seemed a bit expensive at launch or whatever it is. Do you think it's worth it? Um, and get a bit of feedback first. All too often the words limited and uh, ballot and restricted are used and we, we get this frenzy and we say, oh, we have to get our hands on a bottle. I would rather that the frenzy happened sometime after the launch because of the buzz caused in the community. Us all talking about it, Kilkera and 8, for example. You know, people had to, that didn't fly off the shelves immediately. It did very well, don't get me wrong. But it wasn't one of these things that you had to queue up or, or you had to put your name down on a list in the hope that you might get chosen uh, for the privilege of buying a bottle. What happened is that built up steam quite quickly because the community got hold of it saying, wow, it's amazing. And we shared it and we, 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 we got the word out there. I would like it to be more of that. Jason, Whiskey Jason is again, would you agree or disagree with whiskey inflation rate being between 10 to 30% per year? Let's say agree, based purely on the fact that you have tried or, or examined and done some calculations and maths, whereas in me, not so much, but it sounds reasonable to me. A lot of whiskies are climbing at that rate. Others, not so much. Uh, one sub 10, nice to welcome you in my friend, uh, but I think you're getting a lot of your comments blocked uh, just because of, uh, not bad language, uh, but just it's often, it's uh, it, it's picking up some of your adjectives <laughs> and deciding that it's not appropriate. Thomas Elmer is saying, Aquavita, I thought it was because Edredour was targeted and mostly sent to South American market. That left uh, not as good for the rest of the world. Uh, I doubt that would be the case. I think that it was uh, Edredour was maybe often uh, just a product of its time, a product of the owners at that time, a, a mixed bag. A lot of it ended up on the open market and the open market goes out there as a big parcel. They take the good stuff and it, it gets whittled down until what's left is the not so good stuff. And um, But I, I think it's very much becoming a crafted thing. That's uh, The product that's been released now is very representative of what the owners um signatory vintage at Andrew Symington owns it now, what they feel represents Edredour and it's what's good enough quality. I think that's the difference. But there might be some truth in what you say. I've, I've not heard that before, Thomas. Jimmy Legg is saying it's such a great point that Kilkerran made its own name. And I think that's happened with Kilkerran over time since it was first launched in 2016 now, I think. Fantastic. So what do you guys think? Uh, will we get through a quiz in the time that's left? Again, I'm finishing a VPUB again and I don't feel that I've succinctly got through all the topics that I wanted to cover. I don't feel like I've rounded or squared the circle, as they say. I don't think I've uh, fully covered everything in the way I wanted to, but I hope I've got my point across. I hope I've been forgiven for my confession of flipping a bottle of Macallan. I hope you feel... Um, that maybe before you go ahead and, and try something similar, which I will never ever judge you for, by the way, and never will, um, that you go into it with very much open eyes. Uh, Whiskey Games, Dr. Mash Bishop saying, Aquaviti, how do you feel about being someone that can influence prices now? Uh, you know what, Matt, if that's true, I'm not sure that that is true, and it's not just me trying to be, I'm still a very small channel, you know, I'm, I'm still a a small part of a small part of a small community is. Um, but if there is, especially when we talk about batches of whiskey that go out and sometimes single cask is only a hundred, a couple hundred bottles. Um, yeah, I, I think all I can do, Matt, honestly, is influence the price up 
so I feel bad about it. It is absolutely next to impossible for me to be able to influence the prices down. But as a community, maybe bigger than just the whiskey tube community, of course, but as a whiskey community, if we all start to say, ah, bored of this now, and back off, I think we all can. Okay, lots of people starting uh, to, Jimmy Jazz, you started saying forgiven. You learned your lesson, Aquaviti. Thank you so much, Jimmy, for letting me off the hook. I'm going to nurse uh, this wee Optimore, finish off this Glen Caddam. And we'll jump into the quiz. Now, I know I always say it's an easy quiz tonight. I don't think this is very easy. A couple of easy things in there, a couple of dodgy ones. And I'm waiting for Jimmy Leg to tell me that there's some ass hat questions in there as well. But I hope you enjoy it. Of course, like always, watch the numbers going down. 188 of you watching. The last time I looked at that, it was 190 over 200. Um, but it's going to drop off as people disappear. That's okay. That's fine. But maybe you're in the mood tonight to stay around and uh, try out the quiz. You might have a bit of fun. You don't need to declare your scores. Keep it very private. Keep it to yourself. You're only playing against yourself. It's fully multiple choice, fully optional. Um, and uh, yes, good luck, everybody. Let's go in and have the first uh, quiz of the 20s. Question one, when was Speyside first legally recognised as a whiskey region. I touched on this earlier, I don't know if I gave it away or not, um, but uh, uh, yes, I'm speaking about uh, things uh, in the context of what we've been talking about tonight. When was Speyside first legally, that's the key word in that question, recognised as a whiskey region? Was it 1933, was it 1988 or 2008? So I did talk about how uh, Speyside was previously known as Glenlivet. So there was never the Glenlivet, Glenlivet, and that became known as the Glenlivet. And uh, over time, uh, while it's still permitted to use things like Aberlour, Glenlivet, or uh, I don't know what other ones would be used, um, uh, Glenallachie, Glenlivet, or whatever it may be, um, I have to say that... Uh, it's, it's only used by a few purveyors, a few independent bottlers such as uh, Caden Heads and people like that now. We rarely see it, but it's a historical term. But in time, most of it became known as Speyside. And I can tell you now, as I think I have tripped up a lot of people, Karsten Redant, you are correct. Um, anybody else joining you? Uh, Kresimir is correct. Oh my goodness, there's going to be a lot of unhappy people starting off the first quiz of the 20s because I can tell you it's as recently as 2008. And eight, quite incredible that it was that recently. It was used as a term before 2008, but it was only added in uh, to the Scotch uh, Whiskey uh, Regulations that Act that was passed in 2008 as a legal term. Yes, I was surprised too. Apologies for everybody that's going to be a wee bit upset with the banana skin on question number one. Let's move on to question two and ask who famously boasts one of the oldest maturation warehouses positioned partly below sea level. One of Scotland's, they, they say it's the oldest, um, is sometimes contested. So I've decided to uh, question this as one of the oldest maturation warehouses, but partially below sea level. Is it A, Bamore, B, Oban or C, Talisker, who has one of their maturation warehouses partly below sea level and they declare it to be uh, the oldest or one of the oldest in Scotch whisky. Good night, Justin. I can see from uh, the questions, sorry, the answers rather, that this is a, a, a happier question. Most of you seem to know that indeed it is, of course, Bamor on Isla. And I'm talking about uh, their warehouse number one, um, which is partially below sea level. And uh, Bamor will tell you that it's the oldest maturation warehouse in Scotland. So if you said A for Bamor, give yourself a point and we move into question three, which is which of these distilleries uh, are, should be is, I apologise, located in Dublin? Which of these distilleries is located in Dublin? 
Is it Roe and Co? Is that a distillery in Dublin? Is Cologne a distillery in Dublin? Or is Blackwater a distillery in Dublin? I apologise if I'm pronouncing Cologne wrong to any Irish uh, participants tonight, any uh, Irish whiskey aficionados. I may be pronouncing uh, that distillery wrong. Our bag, you see, and I have had a few hours tasting straight from the cask in that warehouse, as have I, Andy. Can I ask why the product that comes out of that distillery doesn't taste anything like the wonders that we taste in that warehouse? There's a disconnect there, and I don't understand why. Which of these distilleries in Dublin? A, Ron Cole, B, Cologne, C, Blackwater. Can I tell you that Dublin is Gaelic uh, for, mm, depends on how you translate it, but uh, do, dove is uh, uh, black. And Lynn is often uh, talking about a small body of water, like a lake or a pool. So literally, Dublin is Blackpool. So that would make you think it's C, but indeed it is Row and Co, as in Dublin. Uh, so if you answered A for Row and Co, brand new distillery in Dublin, owned by uh, Diageo, but very small, half a million litres per annum only. Um, yeah, interesting uh, direction there by Diageo, just a few years after they sold on Bushmills in the north. Um, <laughs> Malcolm Douglas isn't too happy, uh, but you won't get to see it because uh, the chat has suppressed his anger <laughs> because of the adjective he used to describe it. Uh, let's go on to question four, try and get through this as quickly as possible. Which distillery features washbacks recovered from the demolished Capardonic? Okay, so some washbacks before uh, Capardonic was demolished, ended up in this distillery? Was it A, Glen Grant, B, Glen Allake, or C, Speyside? Now, one of the reasons I put this in here is Speyside is actually a distillery. Uh, Spey whiskey comes from the Speyside distillery, as does the black whiskey, which is an abomination, and I wouldn't recommend it to anyone. Um, it's called Ben Dew, uh, just in case you need to know what it is to avoid it, but you'll you'll see it because it's as black as Coca-Cola. Um, Non-age statement, 40%. And uh, overpriced as well. That's from Spey. But they also have started to put out um, a couple of decent whiskies as well. I tried their 18 year old recently and I thought uh, it was actually really quite good. Um, but Speyside is actually um, a distillery as well. Flies under the radar a bit, doing very well in Asia. But is that distillery I'm looking for or is it A. Glen Grant, B. Glen Alhe, or C. Speyside? Capradonic was often referred to as Glen Grant 2. Um, and it's now flattened and uh, the property is owned by Forsyth who make stills. But the answer I'm looking for tonight is B, Glenallachie. Glenallachie uh, took on board two of the steel washbacks from Capardonic and the other six went across to Germany, I believe. Um, Glenallachie, I think, now have eight washbacks in. Two of them are from Capardonic. Um, so there you go. If you answered... Uh, B for Glenallachie. Well done. As we go into the image question, probably the easiest image question I've ever given you. I was just feeling it tonight. I thought maybe it's about time I gave an easy image question and I'm just going to ask what distillery are we looking at here? Is that A, Colila? Is it B, Bunahaven? Or C, Bamor? What are we looking at? Colila? Been a having or see Bamor. Now I read a message. I don't think I've responded to it yet. Somebody was asking me about pronunciation, and they talked about how uh, Kalila was K U L L, and indeed it is. But that's if you're saying it fast. If you were to take your time to pronounce it, it would be Kaul. Kaul, literally how it's written. But if you say it fast, it's Kaul Kalila. Yes, you knowledgeable folks. Uh, Stevie is uh, on the button. He's saying at last a picture question that he knows. And of course, it is indeed a Kalila. Richard Hall is saying defo A. Everybody seems to think A. Greg is four out of five. Owen is four out of five. Fantastic. Whiskey Jason is four out of five. As is Orange Will and Alexandru. Wow. I thought it would be tougher tonight but you are a knowledgeable bunch, as I keep saying. A four out of five for Thomas Elmer as well. Donald Drance 
Uh, Karsten Redant, uh, Marku, Mike Johnson, looks like a new name, Mike, good to have you. Kressimir, 4 out of 5, Alistair, 4 out of 5. Wow, loads of you. I'm not seeing any 5 out of 5s yet. Maybe that banana skin, the opening question. Uh, tripped up a lot of folk. It's gone to question 6 with five minutes left to go, no chance. After a closure of 10 years, which distillery was revived in 2003? Okay, we're looking at three revived distilleries. So it's tougher than perhaps you thought from the question, but what was revived in 2003? A.R. Begg, B. Tullibardin, or C. Brookladdy? It was closed for 10 years and revived in 2003. Yes, I picked all of those answers to be potential answers. Um, I admit I'm being a wee bit tricky. Oh my God, you're going to hate me. Everybody, with very few people thinking otherwise, think it's C, think it's Brook Laddie, but that's wrong. Greg's Whiskey Guide is saying B. Uh, John Paul van der Hoven is also saying B, Scotty S is saying B, as well as Jens Cross, uh, Roger Christofferson. And you guys are right, it was Tullibardin that was revived again in 2003 after a 10-year closure. Um, originally bought out by, uh, by private buyers and then eventually uh, finding success under its current owner's P-card, it was Tullibardin that I was looking for. Ah, lots of people, fat trumpet, Alexandru, um, uh, deciding that uh, that was a banana skin. Okay, let's move on to question seven. In 2003, uh, sorry, in 2013, who released an expression featuring Rockside Farm Barley? So literally the key here is they released an expression featuring Rockside Farm. Was it Kilhoman? Springbank or Brook Laddie? Rockside Farm, 2013. 2013. Let's see how we got on. Rockside Farm is very close to Machia Bay. Don't want to lead you in any way. Yes, you're a knowledgeable crowd, and almost everybody has pegged that exactly as it should be. And of course, it was the Isla Barley of 2013 that was uh, attributed to Rockside Farm. And I believe that Rockside Farm is now owned by Colhoman, but the release, of course, in uh, 2013 was a Brook Laddie Isla Barley release. So if you answered C, good for you. Moving on to question eight. Firing through them tonight, I think I'm doing quite well. Which whiskey YouTube channel or which YouTube whiskey channel can attribute it, its existence to a bottle of Ardmore Legacy? So there's a channel in existence out there and the journey that they're on can be traced back to a single bottle purchase of Ardmore Legacy as A, no nonsense whiskey, my friend Vin. B, Captain 3D, my, fill, my friend, sorry, Phil and Deepa from the West Coast US or C, my friend, the Whiskey Geek, Ben. Was it A, No Nonsense Whiskey, B, Captain 3D, or C, Whiskey Geek? Yes. Scotty S is saying, oh, I was wrong. So maybe he's looking at the crowd. Or maybe he was lot wrong on the previous question. I can tell you that the channel that can attribute its entire channel, exists, Whiskey Journey Existence, back to... Um, a single bottle of Nonny Statement Supermarket Purchased Ardmore Legacy is Phil and Deepa from Captain 3D. Doing unique things on YouTube. Lots of fun and lovely, lovely people too. Second from last question, Edrington's Macallan boasts a capacity of 15 million litres. Huge distillery up there in Speyside. Well, its sister distillery, Highland Park, is what? What size is Highland Park? No Googling, please. A, two and a half million litres at Highland Park, B, four million litres at Highland Park, or C, 5.5 million litres of Highland Park. I don't know how you feel, but I kind of feel the amount of expressions that are out there from Highland Park right now makes me feel like it does about 20 million litres, but it doesn't. 
It's much smaller than you imagine. Obviously, it's very, very malt focused, of course. But there's so much of it available out there in the independent market. Uh, for a time, you couldn't buy independent bottlings of Highland Park, and now there's a glut of it. It's everywhere, and it's further exacerbated by dozens and dozens and dozens of releases from Highland Park themselves. So what capacity is Highland Park? I can tell you, <laughs> Jimmy Legacy, and this is an ask that question. I think it's an interesting question because Highland Park, bizarrely, is fairly small. It's only a two and a half million liter facility. So if you answered A, like so many of you did, uh, you got it right, but I um, I'm going to predict, and by the looks of it, it's a wee bit all over the place. A lot of you perhaps thought it was quite a bit bigger than that. Um, but yes, two and a half million litres at Highland Park. How are we getting on? Anybody sitting on nine out of nine? I'm, I'm scanning, I'm scanning. I didn't see any five out of fives, so I don't, uh, I don't think there's going to be any nine out of nines so far. Greg is doing really well. He's apologising, but he's on eight out of nine. Fantastic though. Seven out of nine for Whiskey Radar. Good to see you, Roland. Mark Slinger, six. Sid Martin, good to see you. Sid and Mark, six each. One glass man as well, six. Daniel Vermas doing well on eight. Jens on eight. Okay, let's go into question 10 and ask. Taking the, <laughs> this is an ask that question. <laughs> taking the X10 bus from north, from Glasgow's Buchanan Street bus station, will take you to where? Will it take you to Auchentoshan Distillery? Will it take you to Glen Goyne Distillery? Or will it take you to Oban Distillery? Please think about this. Please apply a wee bit of <laughs> thinking. If I jumped on the X10 bus north from Glasgow's Buchanan bus station, would I end up at Auchentoshan, Glen Goyne, or Oban? <laughs> oh, dear. Okay, sometimes you must... Uh, <laughs> realize that I'm kind of struggling for some quiz questions at times. But this is kind of fun. And so many questions I get are, um, I'm in Glasgow, what can I go to see whiskey? And um, Glen Goyne is reachable, Ochentoshan is reachable, and Oban is reach reachable all by public transport. Stevie is saying, Aquavita, that's just mean. <laughs> no, but it's helpful, Steve. Trust me, especially for guys like you that will one day arrive in Scotland and wonder how to get to B, Glen Goyne Distillery. If you go to Buchanan bus station and take the X10, um, eventually it'll go past the front door of Glen Goyne Distillery. <laughs> and I apologise um, for a cheeky but fun and hopefully informative <laughs> question. Jimmy Legg is, is relieved because he got a pass mark. Thomas Elmer gets seven, Daniel Vermas nine, Daniel you star, Mark Slinger seven, Marcus Kreitner seven, Whiskey Novice is saying yay, uh, Too Slow is saying seven out of ten, <laughs> Steve Hayes saying I did manage seven out of ten, Greg is saying he's lucky, oh, I'm looking at anybody, Greg's Whiskey Guide, I think you've um, taken it on nine out of ten tonight, um, was that another nine out of ten I spotted, Daniel, and Greg tonight, yes, nine out of ten. Any other nine out of tens? And uh, Jimmy Jazz is saying, maybe in March I'll take that X10. If you do, Jimmy, perhaps I'll be sat right next to you. Wouldn't that be a thing? You never know. Whiskey Novice is saying that was the bus Jack and Victor got in still game. Absolutely. Ralphie shared that on his Patreon recently. I don't know if it was a public release, uh, but in Ralphie's Patreon, he shared the clip of still game where Jack and Victor, two of these Glaswegian characters, uh, went to visit the Glen Goyne distillery. Um, it was a lot of nonsense in the, in the, but it was a lot of fun as well. Great fun. Jens Roger Christofferson. Jens, you got nine out of 10 as well. Fantastic stuff. Superb. I um, feel a wee bit uh, afraid tonight. I feel a wee bit like it was a bit all over the place, but I often feel like that after these things. Uh, I hope it was still enjoyable for you guys. Thankful and grateful for everybody that turned up to enjoy a wee bit of whiskey community on a Thursday evening again. I have overrun, as always. Bloody do it. It's so frustrating. Even when I'm doing it on my own, I always overrun. I apologise. Greg's Whiskey Gary is saying, uh, uh, X10 is easy to remember, so thanks for the tip. Yeah, an X, Roman numeral for 10, and 10 takes you to Glen Goyne. Train to Oban and a different bus altogether to get out to the west to visit Ochentoshan. Um, superb, Ballister Gray saying another classic quiz. Thank you. Steve A is saying uh, Aquavite Slancha. Um, look, so many of you, you're just very, very classy people just saying thanks anyway. I think the quiz was a bit prickly. 
I'm not going to promise that I can do any better next time, um, but I'm glad that some of you at least had some fun. Let me raise uh, this generous uh, Octomore Masterclass 8.2 from Marcus, and I'm going to sit with these Glen Goyne teapot drums, um, and I'll, f I'll, I'll either share with you in a VPUB, I'll certainly share with... Uh, my patron folk. Uh, patrons, there will be a, a lock-in coming very soon. I know that you're overdue one from December. I'm looking tentatively at Sunday night. I'll keep you informed through Patreon about that. The next VPUB is two weeks from tonight. It's a five-week month. So it could be that it's uh, instead of being the second and last, it's second, uh, second last and last as well. But I'll ask my patrons first if they're okay with that. And um, five week months, I usually try to do three V pubs because they're always confusion what what weeks it going to be. So I cover both weeks. So it could be that January sees us having three V pubs. Um, so, but regardless, next week is a break and two weeks from tonight, which will be uh, uh, the twenty third, I guess. Um, that sounds right. And then the thirtieth would be the last week of the month. <laughs> Mick O'Donnell is in. Good to see you, Mick, saying you flip one lousy sheep. <laughs> I know the joke you're talking about, Mick, and it's a peach. Well done. Um, our bag is saying goodnight. Daniel Vermas is saying thanks. Um, everybody, thank you so much. Greg's Whiskey Guide saying it wasn't a big deal, mate, the flipping. It was to me. I lost a hundred quid, Greg. I lost a bottle of, well, no, I didn't even lo lose a bottle of Glen Goyne Batch 7. Last year, I would have lost a bottle of Glengoyne, but this year, with the price increase, I didn't even lose a full bottle of Glengoyne teapot ram. I'm trying to find silver linings. Anyway, my friends, my fantastic barflies, my wonderful whiskey community, and my treasured patrons, I'm going to raise a glass and say thank you all so much. A very, very happy new year. I wish you all the very best in life and in whiskey in 2020. And I look forward to hanging out with you all in this fantastic place uh, that is the V Pub in two weeks' time. Slanchava.